Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Egypt's Morsi consolidates power after reshuffling the military leadership. Lebanon gets dragged into the Syrian conflict with alleged terror plot. And the series of attacks on occupation soldiers continues in Afghanistan. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. A series of decisions was followed by a speech where he voiced the reasoning behind these decisions. It is Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi who surprised the Egyptians with decisive and unexpected decisions. Morsi seized legislative powers and implemented drastic changes to the military leadership, most notably sending Field Marshal Hussein Tontawi and his deputy Army Chief of Staff Semi Anin to retirement. Revolutionary and Islamist forces welcomed these decisions as thousands took to the street to support support the president. However, others considered the decisions to be surprising and that they were adopted without compromising with the military institution. Our correspondent Taufiq Ahmed reports from Cairo. Wide-scale political and popular reactions were in support of Morsi's decisions. Thousands of citizens went to Tahrir Square and other revolutionary squares to announce their joy over the dismissal of Tantawi and Anan. They called on the president to topple figures of the old regime. We've been waiting for these great decisions for a long time. They came just in time. And thank God this is a fatal blow to corruption. He has had a big responsibility lately, so he decided to dismiss them but appoint them as presidential advisors. I think this is a good decision because he respected the history of the people and took a revolutionary step. This is one of the revolution's days. It is almost complete. President Morsi, who issued these decisions at a very sensitive time, utilized Laylat al-Qadr, or the Night of the Power, celebrations to confirm that the decision to dismiss Tantawi and Anan was not personal. Rather, it was aimed at serving Egypt's interests and bringing in new blood to the Egyptian leadership. Loyalty is a must towards those who were loyal. I never intend to direct to anyone or to any individual a negative message. I only intended, and God only knows what I intend, I only intended to serve the interests of this nation and this people. There were conflicting reports over the military council's knowledge of these decisions before they were issued. Some sources said that they came following consultations with Tantawi, while others denied that the military knew about these dismissals, saying on the contrary that they were surprising. Morsi issued a new constitutional declaration and drastic decisions with which he seized all presidential powers and ended, in theory, the military council's political role. So will the council's role fade away, or will the turbulent conditions the country is experiencing prevent that from happening. Taufiq Ahmed, Dubai TV, Cairo. One of the most prominent figures that Morsi's decisions brought to power is Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who was appointed defense minister as replacement for Field Marshal Tantawi. Al-Sisi is the youngest member of the Egyptian Military Council. He was born in 1954 and assumed a number of military posts, the latest of which was chief of military intelligence before being appointed defense minister. In addition, Judge Mahmoud Mekki joined the presidential circle by becoming vice president. In 2005, he was a leader of the judicial independence movement. He was also deputy of the Court of Appeals. He left the judiciary and worked as a lawyer after he was accused of harming his fellow judges, but he was then acquitted. Morsi, who is facing an open front in Sinai, vowed to crush the militants and to chase them until they are eliminated from the area. For the sixth consecutive day, the Egyptian army's military operations are continuing against the militants there. Today, a security source said that extremist militants shot tribal elder Khalaf al mani and his son as they were heading back from a conference organized by tribal leaders to condemn the operations against the Egyptian army sites. No one claimed responsibility for the assassination. And while the military campaign is escalating in Sinai, 
Reuters news agency reported that a source close to the militants said that, quote, hundreds of them organized a secret meeting last night to look into how they will respond to the developments in Sinai. Lebanon's military tribunal adjourned the hearing of former minister Michel Sameha to an unspecified date. Sameha's lawyer expressed hope in maintaining the judicial path away from political pressure. Defense lawyer Malik Syed considered the leaks of Sameha's interrogation as very harmful to the investigation. El Syed confirmed that the Lebanese Minister of Justice has vowed to investigate how these leaks occurred. The defense lawyer refused to answer if Sameha was subjected to pressure during his interrogation. Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Makati announced that the judiciary will continue to investigate the case of former Information Minister Michel Sameha until it is resolved. Mikati confirmed that following the investigation, he will take a political stance and decision that would maintain Lebanon's sovereignty. The case is no longer merely about the arrest of Minister Michel Smeha. The military judge's indictment includes the Syrian security regime for the very first time. This development has confused the authorities that have been holding on to a policy of disassociation since the beginning of the Syrian crisis. The prime minister says this policy is based on the principle of non-interference in the affairs of others. For this reason, he says, it is unacceptable for others to intervene in Lebanon's affairs or turn the country into a field to settle scores and export crises. As for the recent developments in the case, a mobilization has started demanding a wider investigation since the explosive devices that were confiscated are reportedly very similar to those used in the assassinations of Samir Qasir and George Hawi and the attempted assassination of broadcast journalist Meish according to the An nahar newspaper. In the same framework, the March 14th coalition mobilized its forces to demand the authorities to to take stringent measures. The Syrian ambassador in Lebanon must quickly be expelled and diplomatic relations with this regime must be temporarily frozen. A complaint must also be filed at the UN to reveal these facts. As for the March 8 coalition, it has refrained from commenting on the issue and is waiting for the results of the investigation, with the exception of a symbolic protest held in front of the military tribunal. Some of Smeha's supporters organized the protest, but sources close to the March 8 coalition indicated that a media escalation will serve neither the enemies of the regime here nor its allies. They placed all these issues in the same framework. This does not serve anyone and does not serve the truth. This serves a plan that is much bigger than Michel Sameha and much bigger than Wissam Hassan, with all due respect to both of them. And it is much bigger than the entire Lebanese game. There's a grand plan for the region. The authorities say the leaks related to this case are dangerous. But what could later be revealed in the investigation might be even more dangerous. As for the repercussions, they are certainly larger than a mere settling of local accounts. Now, another so-called green-on-blue attack in Afghanistan. An Afghan police officer turns his gun on U.S. dead soldiers in the eastern province of Nangarhar. There are conflicting reports about the fate of the foreign troopers. Some sources say several were killed. Other reports say at least two were injured and rushed to hospital. Provincial officials say the attacker managed to escape. The latest attack comes on the heels of another shooting on Friday when a civilian employee at a military base in western Afghanistan shot dead three U.S.-led soldiers. NATO has confirmed that at least 37 of its troops have been killed by Afghan security forces since the beginning of 2012. The Taliban have regularly claimed its members are responsible for most of these attacks. While well, Afghans remain opposed to the continued U.S. military presence in their country, they now say they can no longer tolerate the situation. The U.S. is pulling some of its troops out of the country, but Afghans are demanding a full withdrawal. Presidio's Faiz Khorshid has more. U.S. forces are drawing down here in Afghanistan. They're going back home. 
By the end of this year, 20,000 American forces will leave. This move has been welcomed by Afghans. People here want their own forces to take the lead. We cannot tolerate the presence of foreign troops anymore, they say. The presence of foreign troops is not acceptable to us anymore. We want all of them to leave our country immediately and our own forces should carry out the operations. But it's not a full withdrawal. It's just a drawdown. About 30,000 U.S. Special Forces will stay in Afghanistan even beyond 2014, a deadline for NATO military operations here. Afghans know this. Therefore, they fear a bleak future. All what they want is a quick and full U.S. military exit. On the streets of Kabul, Afghans told us that they will not be safe unless U.S.-led forces are pulled out. We don't want the foreign troops to stay because more people will be killed if these forces do not leave our country. We do not feel safe in their presence. This was not the case 10 years ago. These people welcomed U.S. forces as their protectors against the Taliban. They were helping them in the fight against the militants. But their attitude has completely changed. Now they believe U.S. forces are as bad as the Taliban. And this Afghan journalist explained why. Well, there are several factors that turn Afghans against the foreign troops. Uh, disrespecting the Afghan tradition and uh, fail their failure to bring peace in the country and civilian casualties in their military operations. Iran steps up relief operations following the devastating twin earthquakes in the country's northwest. The official death toll now stands at 306. The health ministry says more than 3,000 people have also been injured. Most of the victims are women and children. Thousands of tents have already been set up to shelter the displaced. Iran's Vice President Mohammad Reza Rahimi has arrived in Tabriz with a high-ranking delegation which includes ministers and parliamentarians. The quakes hit the towns of Ahar, Heris and Varzakhan in East Azerbaijan province two days ago. They measured 6.4 and 6.3 on the Richter scale. I'm talking to you from Chai Kandy, 15 kilometers outside Varzaran, one of the epicenters of the two devastating earthquakes uh, which hit uh, uh, north northwest Iran a few days ago. As you can see behind me, uh, people uh, have been accommodated in uh, tents. Uh, yesterday, when I was on the way uh, back to Varzaran, I saw that uh, the number of tents uh, was not enough for whole people who. Uh, we're here yesterday, but now today we see that the number of tents has increased, so it means that relief operation still continues in this region. The following program contains graphic scenes that some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The Free Syrian Army downed a Syrian military plane, then broadcast a video of the arrested pilot. As for the regime, it broadcast a video displaying brutal acts by opposition fighters as the shelling continues in Aleppo, Damascus and its countryside. These brutal scenes are as removed from humanity and human rights as possible. They were posted online and attributed to opposition fighters from the Free Army in Aleppo province. The fighters can be seen slaughtering a man without blinking by slitting his throat. <laughs> The video shows a blindfolded and handcuffed man resisting a group of men, forcing him to lie on the ground. Then one of the men slits his throat with a knife more than once until his blood starts flowing on the sidewalk amid cries of God is great. One of the men can be heard saying, this is the fate of every Shabiha and every government supporter. On the ground in Syria, the scene has not changed much in the past few days, as the beginning of the week witnessed the shelling of Damascus and its countryside Aleppo, and specifically the neighborhood of Salahuddin. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said Syrian regime forces stormed the Saif al dawla neighborhood, located in the western part of the city, and clashed with a number of fighters. Meanwhile, the Free Syrian Army announced its control over the Syrian regime's largest checkpoint in Tafas in Dara province. 
The Free Syrian Army announced that it downed a MiG military plane the group said was shelling the city of Mohassan in the province of Deir Azur. A brigade that calls itself the descendants of Mohammed and is affiliated with the Free Syrian Army broadcast a video of the arrested Syrian pilot. Colonel Staff Pilot Mofid Mohammed Suleiman. What was the mission you were assigned? We were assigned to shell the city of Mohassan. What would you tell the soldiers of al-Assad's army? I would tell them to defect from this gang. On the other hand, the official Syrian news agency Sana said that a military plane crashed as it was conducting a routine training mission in the eastern province. The pilot was forced to eject from the plane due to a technical failure. Syrian TV announced that specialized agencies confronted an armed terrorist group in the area of Jamia al-Zahra in Aleppo, killing and wounding many of them. It added that it raided terrorist hideouts in the neighborhoods of Old Damascus and found tunnels that contain a variety of weapons and grenades and Israeli-made bombs. Politically, the Syrian Foreign Ministry welcomed Tehran's consultative meeting on Syria in which Iran called for starting a dialogue between the Syrian regime and opposition groups, confirming it will continue to build on these positive initiatives. Headlines about an imminent Israeli attack on Iran are appearing on page one in Israel's local newspapers every day. The war drums are beating, but is it real or is it designed simply to create the impression that Israel will attack Iran before the U.S. presidential election? IBA's Eli Wagelantir is here. He's been following developments. Good evening, Eli. Good evening. Thank you, Yochanan. Let me begin by saying that all the media talk about war is just that, talk. No one knows what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Ehud Barak are planning and anyone who says they know are just acting like big shots. Nevertheless, we are seeing columns being written day after day talking of an imminent attack, about Israel being unprepared, and how Israel could influence the U.S. election by launching a strike against Iran before November 6th, because the equation will change after Election Day. <clears throat> Apparently, the rhetoric is working. One non-Israeli news website published an article today headlined, Five Signs that Israel is Close to Attacking Iran. It cites the cabinet's decision yesterday to grant the prime minister extended decision-making powers, making it easier for him to bypass opposition within the government for a strike on Iran. Second, a home front drill this week, including text testing the nationwide text message system. Third, that St Stanley Fisher, the governor of the Bank of Israel, said on Friday that Israel's financial system is preparing for an Israeli strike on Iran and the resulting downturn in the economy. Fourth, the France has set up contingency plans for a mass evacuation of French citizens living in Israel in the event of war. That plan is for them to gather at the Jaffa port and transfer to French naval vessels stationed off the coast. And fifth is the media blitz itself. Netanyahu lashed out yesterday at the spate of newspaper stories reporting on an imminent Israeli attack, the opposition to such an attack by senior defense establishment officials, and the country's lack of preparedness for its aftermath. He called it a worldwide scandal, designed to prevent Israel from independent action. Netanyahu said that while he only spoke little and in measured way about Iran, others were creating damage by making a specific information and operational details part of the public discussion. Meanwhile, the fear among some Israeli citizens that war was imminent was enough to produce a demonstration last night against war. A couple of hundred protesters demonstrated in downtown Tel Aviv, calling on the government not to attack Iran. Gathering outside the apartment block in which Barack lives, the protesters carried signs condemning a possible Israeli strike and called on Barack and Netanyahu to resign rather than endanger the lives of Israeli citizens. We came here to call upon the government, especially to call upon the defense minister and the prime minister, to stop and think, to negotiate, to, uh, to follow the international boycott on Iran, to cooperate with the U.S. and with the international community, but not attack. As for whether the United States and Israel are on the same page for dealing with Iran, Mariv reported today, quoting diplomatic sources, that the U.S. would support Israel if Jerusalem were to take military action against Israel. According to the report, Washington would provide Israel with an air defense umbrella against the anticipated retaliation by Tehran and its proxies, notably Hezbollah, in the event of a strike. Whether the two countries are out of sync could be cleared up next month 
When Netanyahu and President Barack Obama meet at the opening of the 67th session of the UN General Assembly. The Tunisian government decided to form a national commission for the prevention of torture and to monitor prisons in cooperation with civil and human rights organizations. This comes in response to demands by rights organizations to end the torture of prisoners that was carried out by the previous regime. The organizations believe torture is continuing after the revolution. The worst kind of torture is the one Tunisians endured during the Bourguiba and Ben Ali eras. These regimes didn't spare anyone, targeting leftists, nationalists, soldiers, and especially Islamists. Today, political prisoners are demanding rehabilitation and compensation for the financial and moral harm they suffered after their rights were violated for decades. All types of torture were used. Physical torture causes harm that persists today. They would break the prisoners' fingers and legs, and some people people were released with permanent disabilities, and there are some people who died. Although the worst forms of torture were practiced in the past, a number of rights organizations believe signs of torture and some abuse persist in Tunisian prisons today. And even though torture differs from what it looked like in the past, everyone is urging that it be addressed. In the past, torture was systematic everywhere, and sometimes it had no purpose. This doesn't mean that torture does not exist today. Torture does exist, and it is still happening. The Tunisian government, in cooperation with civil society, decided to form a national commission for the prevention of torture. The commission that is composed of independent representatives of civil society confirms the reformist path adopted by the government against all types of torture, especially since many officials are former political prisoners. The commission will monitor Tunisian prisons and prevent all forms of torture. If these practices exist, they are certainly not government policies. It is not a way to govern. It's definitely the practices of some individual. There's a need for judicial and security reforms. Judicial reform is also needed and can be achieved by disqualifying the judges that are concealing torture or by reforming the judicial institution in general. Reforming the security institution is necessary and can be completed by removing those who were in charge of torture. The Tunisian government is trying to overcome all forms of torture that were practiced by the Bourguiba and Ben Ali regimes, as violations in post-revolution Tunisia still exist, and especially since some of the former regime's allies are continuing to work in the Tunisian prisons and in the interior and judicial ministries. Hassan al-Shari, al-Alam, Tunis. In Somalia, the number of presidential candidates for the election scheduled for August 20th is continuing to rise. In an unprecedented political move, Somali President Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, Prime Minister Abdi Wali Muhammad Ali, and Speaker of Parliament Sharif Hassan Sheikh Adam have all announced their presidential candidacy. The three leaders are facing internal criticism over the use of state resources to finance their election campaigns. Our correspondent Ali Halali has the details. The candidacy of the three main officials in the current Somali administration comes as part of their efforts to return to power, following their long-term alliance which crumbled after the leaders failed to nominate one candidate. In response, each candidate decided to fight on a separate front in the presidential battle. Somali presidential candidates and politicians have criticized the three leaders over the use of state funds, media and security resources to finance their election campaigns. State funds and property shouldn't be used to finance these types of campaigns. These are public funds that should be used in the public's interest and not for personal gains. The decision by the three top officials to cling to their positions and join the presidential race has stirred debates among Somali political circles. This comes amid calls for the resignation of the three leaders following the announcement of their candidacies, which they say will help provide an equal platform for all candidates.
The way I see it, it's not fair for the three candidates to maintain their positions. They should have resigned from their positions a long time ago. Although they have been asked to resign, they haven't done so. Less than 10 days are left. Each of the three men has a different background. President Sharif Sheikh Ahmed is affiliated with the Islamic movement, which described itself as moderate. Prime Minister Abdulwali Muhammad Ali is associated with the technocrat movement, which includes exiled Somali scholars who have received prestigious degrees. For his part, Speaker of Parliament Sharif Hassan Sheikh Adam represents a role model for leadership in business and multi-tribal affiliation. With the August 20th election day approaching, the number of Somali presidential candidates is continuing to rise in a rather complicated process overshadowed by political, tribal, financial and foreign variables. Ali Halali, BBC, Mogadishu. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.